Hey everyone, welcome to Valley Creek. We are one church that meets in multiple campuses and we carry the hope of Jesus to thousands of locations. My name's Ryan and I serve on our digital team. We are so glad that you're here and we know that God has something in store for you today. Now there are hope carriers from all over the world with us online right now. So no matter what platform you're on, jump in the chat and say hello. And if this is your first time with us at Valley Creek Online, or if this is your campus, let us know by scanning the QR code or going to valleycreek.org online. We have resources we'd love to send you, special invitations to online events and more opportunities to help you connect with other people here at Valley Creek. There are a lot of great things happening around Valley Creek and we don't want you to miss out. So I wanna invite you to stay connected with us. Some great ways you can do that are on our social media channels and our text updates. You can stay aware of everything that's happening and hear about some great opportunities for you to take next steps. The Bible tells us that in God's presence is fullness of joy. Well, God is here to meet with us. So may joy fill our hearts as we worship Him together.
righteousness, the radiance of holiness, Son of Man, God in flesh, the spotless Lamb, laid down to rest, with sin redeemed, His grace was born, calling
the work is done and because of Jesus and the blood that he shed for us on the cross we can have hope you can have hope hope for your marriage hope for that situation hope for your future hope for that lost person you've been praying for and it's not just something nice that we like to say because it sounds good or because it feels good to say but it's a promise from the Lord to you that you would actually know and believe that you have hope. And so whatever you came in here with today, like if you're struggling, whatever you're struggling with, can I just declare over your life right now that because of Jesus, there is
And there's hope for the broken Hope for the lost There's hope for the grieving heart There's hope for the chaos And hope for the storm Sometimes that's all we need to know is that your presence is always with us. So we thank you for that promise. It's in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Hey, so good worshiping with you guys. Hey, before you find your seat, turn to some people around you and say hello to them. This is Bill. Bill is running low on hope. He wouldn't say it, but he's lost, lonely, and broken. But Bill lives next door to Dylan, and Dylan is a hope carrier, a disciple of Jesus living on mission to change his world. Every time he sees Bill, Dylan smiles and says hello and asks him how he's doing. Dylan is the only one of Bill's neighbors who does this, and Bill finds it odd but he likes Dylan, and it's a great way to start the day. Bill works at a bank, and he does not like working at a bank. But his manager is Krista, and Krista is a hope carrier. She carries the hope of Jesus wherever she goes, and that includes where she works. She sees work as an opportunity to set an example by doing everything with all her heart. It makes Bill think, maybe my work's not so bad. Bill checks Instagram during lunch. Among the usual noise, every now and then, Bill sees people sharing hope. He didn't know he was friends with so many hope carriers. Miles away from Bill lives Ellen, Bill's grandmother. Ellen prays for Bill every day and has since he was a kid. Ellen knows prayer works and has faith that God is working on Bill. Ellen is a hope carrier. Bill plays basketball with some buddies on Wednesday nights. After the game, Bill's friend Ty tells him about what God has been doing in him through his church. Bill has seen through Ty's words and actions that he's just not as angry as he used to be. Ty invites Bill to come to church with him, and after being surrounded by hope all day, Bill says yes. While Bill's at church, he discovers more about Jesus, the living hope that he's been experiencing through all the hope carriers around him. Now he's found, connected, and restored. Never underestimate what God is doing through you. Every day, God gives opportunities to plant the seeds of hope, to water those seeds, and every day, God is making those seeds grow. You are a hope carrier. 
It's time to change your world. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Valley Creek. I'm so glad you're here with us today. And what a great weekend we had last weekend as we got to celebrate 179 people getting baptized. It is a great reminder that together we are a family on mission. And on the backside of all those changed lives, what we wanted to do today was just stop and go back and remind ourselves of what God has been teaching us this year. You see, this year we started something called the Hope Carrier Initiative, one of the most important, significant things we've ever done. It's not just a series, it's not just a set of talks, it's a theology. It's a way of life. It's a worldview, and it's the direction we're moving as a church. And so what we don't want to do is just assume that everybody's got hope carriers and know what it means and know what it's like and is living it out in their life. We want to go back and say, this is what God is calling us to, and this is the life that we want to live. See, some of you, you've never heard it before, so all this is brand new. Some of you, you've heard it, and if you're honest, you've already forgot it, and you never really took any activity or or faith moving towards it. And some of you, you've heard it, and you've been working on it throughout this year. And so before we keep moving forward, we want to stop and look back, because this is where God is leading us as a church. And so today, can you by faith believe that God wants to lift up your eyes, open up your ears, and speak to your heart because you were created for so much more. I mean, have you ever heard the story of the woman at the well? Really interesting story in the Gospels. One day, this woman goes to a well in the middle of the day to draw water. And the reason she's going in the middle of the day is because she's just had enough of all of it. She's tired of the gossip. She's, she's done with the slander. She's sick of the criticism. She's, she's been married five times and she's living with a sixth man and she just doesn't want to hear none of it from no one. And while she's there, Jesus approaches her and asks her for a drink. And she's shocked. She looks at him and basically says, you, a rabbi Jewish man is asking me, a sinful Samaritan woman, for a drink? And in that moment, Jesus completely interrupts her life. And I think today God is interrupting some of your lives. And they start talking and they have this conversation and she tells Jesus all about her tradition and her religion and her worship and her way of life. And you you see that she has all this religious knowledge in her head and she begins talking about her relationships and the brokenness and all the things there. And as she talks, if you read the story, you, you get this reality that here is a woman who is bored. She's just going through the motions. She's been there, done that, tried that. She's gone to the well of religion. She's gone to the well of the world. She's gone to the well of self. And it has left her thirsty, wanting for more. And so Jesus says to her, hey, if you knew who I was and what I offered, you would ask me for a drink and I would give you springs of living water. And she says, sir, give me that drink. And for the first time in her life, the kingdom of God enters into her. It's a spring of living water inside of her, flowing through her, and it is uncontainable. And so the woman gets up from where Jesus is, leaving her water jar because she's not thirsty anymore and she doesn't have to keep drawing from religion or self or the world. The woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They, the whole city, came out of the town and made their way toward him. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. They said to the woman, now we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Do you catch it? One of the first hope carriers in all of the New Testament is a sinful, middle-aged, bored, outcast woman. It's almost like Jesus is telling us, hey, if she can be a hope carrier, so can you. 
And all she did was go back to her town and tell people her story. She has no training. She has no equipping. She hasn't won any awards. She doesn't have any experience. She just goes back and tells people who Jesus is and what he did in her life. And it changes the entire city. It's almost like Jesus touched her knowing she was going to be the key to touching them. Jesus touches you knowing you're going to be the key to touching them. He's touched you because you're in the perfect place of influence and authority and position and resources and job and neighborhood and gifting, knowing that you will be the key to touching the city around you. And what I love about Jesus is when he touches us, whatever he touches us with, we become. Jesus is the light of the world. And when he touches you with that light, you now become the light of the world. Jesus is the righteousness of God. And when he touches you with that righteousness, you now become the righteousness of God, the Bible tells us. Jesus is grace. And when he touches you with that grace, you become an agent of grace in this world. Jesus is forgiveness. And when he touches you with that forgiveness, you become a minister of reconciliation in this world. Jesus is living hope. And when he touches you with that hope, you become a hope carrier in Jesus name, hope carrier, a disciple of Jesus living on mission to change their world, a disciple. A learner, a follower, a student, one who becomes like the one they're following, a disciple of Jesus, living on mission to change their world. Not the world, because that's too big and we get overwhelmed and quit, but my world, where I am right here and right now. A disciple, someone's li someone whose life has been interrupted by Jesus and they have decided to submit and surrender their kingdom to his. So you were created for more. You weren't made to just go to work and just go to school, and just go home and watch Netflix with a bag of Cheetos? Come on. You were created to dream with God, to bring divine solutions to this world, heavenly wisdom, supernatural power. You're not meant to draw from the well of religion, to draw from the well of this world, to draw from the well of self. You're meant to have rivers of living water flowing through you. Come on, just think of how much God believes in you. He not only has brought you into his kingdom, he's entrusted his kingdom to you. He says you're the head and not the tail, that the kingdom is within you, that the spirit of the living God is within you. You have the keys to the kingdom. You are made in his image and his likeness. You, you have been empowered by Jesus to go and do the very things that he has done. God believes in you and you were created for more than to just live like everyone else around you. Come on, look at these couple verses with me. Living within you as a follower of Jesus is the Christ who floods you with the expectation of glory. This belief that there is the goodness of God on the horizon. This mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory for his people. And God wants everyone to know it. It says the moment you put your faith in Jesus, he comes and dwells inside of you. Living hope is now in there. And it's almost like you walk through this life with a treasure chest of hope inside of you. And it's not meant to be closed and locked up and hidden away. It's meant to be opened up and shared with the world. And it's almost like for that woman, the more you give it away, the more you discover it for yourself. And you start to understand the mystery. Or how about this one? Now may God. The fountain of hope, the spring of living water, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy and perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with his super abundance until you radiate with hope. Man, that is a great verse. It says that the spirit of the living God inside of you is literally a spring of living water and you start to radiate with hope. You become radioactive radioactive with hope. Think of something that's radioactive. It's contagious. It has influence. It impacts and affects everything it gets around. You radiate with hope. In other words, I could say it to you like this, you glow with the glory of God. 
And the world longs for the glory of God. And so when you step into any space, you're radioactive with the influence of heaven, glowing with the very glory of God like Moses did when he came off the mountain after meeting with God or like Jesus when he was transfigured. You have that same glory inside of you shining through to show the world who Jesus is and what he has done. One more. For if by the trespass of the one man, Adam, death reigned, through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? It says, when Adam sinned and fell, death reigned. But when Jesus came, he changed everything. And now through his grace and his righteousness, we reign in life. The word reign literally means to be king and to have the ultimate influence. When Adam sinned, death was king and had the ultimate influence. But now in Jesus, he is king. And when we submit our kingdom to him, we reign with him and have the ultimate influence on this earth, ruling and reigning co-commissioned with God as his representative on this earth. You literally reign in this life through the grace and righteousness of Jesus Christ. Are you with me on this? Okay, now, this is where this gets fun. You ready? Okay. The kingdom of God is a movement of hope. The kingdom of God is a movement of hope, and the kingdom and the church are not the same thing. This is really important. Sometimes we interchange the word church and the kingdom. They're not the same thing. The church is a part of the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is bigger than the church. God wants his kingdom to also be in family, and education, healthcare, business, government, arts and media, sports and technology, the places of, of, of life that you and I go every single day. You say, okay, well, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is simply the rule and reign of God. It's where things are submitted and surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus. It's the effective range of God's will. It's what God is doing. And God, like any king, reigns or rules through his words and his actions. Isn't that how any king reigns and rules? Through their words, what they say, and through their actions, what they do. Which is why your tongue and your actions have so much authority and power in your life. The tongue has the power of life and death. Whatever you're saying is either aligning with God's kingdom or it's rebelling against it. And your actions are either surrendering to the lordship of his kingdom or rebelling and resisting it. God reigns through his words and through his actions. And so the church is the people of God, united by the spirit of God, under the lordship of Jesus sent to change the world. The church is an extension of the kingdom of God. And it's not so much that the church has a mission, but that the mission of the kingdom has a church. A people through which God is doing his work on this earth right here and right now. This is why Jesus, when he tells us to pray, he says, uh, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on not just the church, earth as it is in heaven. It's why 1 John 3 says Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Where do the works of the devil need to primarily be destroyed? Hopefully not in the church. <laughs> That's really bad church. If it's true, he destroys the works of the devil in us, but then he wants to destroy the works of the devil through us in the areas of life. How about John 20 when Jesus says, as the father has sent me, so I send you. The way that the father sent me into this world and the things I did and where I did them, I'm sending you to go and do it the exact same way. Where did Jesus do his work? All the areas of life. The temple in homes, in the synagogues, the education center, where sick people were, in the marketplace, through both the Jewish and Roman government. In media, he was the greatest storyteller that ever lived. He played with children, sports, and on the Roman road, the greatest technological advance of that day and age. It would be like the TikTok of today. <laughs> Catch me on that. In the areas of life. Genesis 1 28, first thing God says to humanity, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it using all its vast resources in the service of God and man. God says, hey, I've commissioned you 
to rule and reign with me. Get outside of yourself and go take authority over this place. Be fruitful. Live a life of productive beauty, bringing things to the fullness of their potential and multiply. Reproduce the life of God in you, in the world, around you, and fill the earth or your areas of influence with the knowledge of the glory of the goodness of God and subdue things. Where did things need to be subdued? In the garden. Not in the Garden of Eden at the time. In the rest of the world. We'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. Subdue things. Bring order to chaos. Bring hope to despair. Bring wisdom to foolishness. Bring love to hate with the opposite spirit. And then use your resources to accomplish God's purposes in the lives of men. Come on. I'm giving you a bunch of verses here because I'm trying to build this this, this thought process for you. Matthew 28, the resurrected Jesus, one of the last things he says is, all authority on heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you always. Okay, if Jesus has all authority, then the giants in the areas of life have none. None. Because if he has all, they can't have any. So the giants of disease and sickness and poverty and brokenness and divorce, they have no authority. Jesus has all authority. He says, therefore, I'm now giving that authority to you and sending you to make disciples of all nations. Now, when we hear disciples of all nations, we think going on a mission trip to a third world country. That's great. That's a part of it, but it's bigger than that. Discipling nations, the word nations is the word ethnos. It means people group. And yes, people group together by the country they live in, but they also group together by the areas of life in which they are living or have influence. And the truth is, if you think about it, the NFL as a ethnos, a people group, probably has more influence in the world than the nation of Tonga. Do you agree? Okay. Hollywood as a area of life, as an ethnos people group, probably has more influence in the world than Azerbaijan. Agree? Yeah. Yes. The U.S. government probably has more authority and influence in the world than maybe, let's say, the nation of Panama. Agree? Yeah. So when he's saying disciple nations, ethnos, he's saying think bigger. It's not just countries. Yes, it's countries, and yes, it's ethnicities, but it's also the people groups and the way that we choose to group ourselves and go every single day. We can literally take over an entire area of life to influence this world, to disciple them, to teach them to think the very thoughts and live in the very ways of God. This is why Jesus says that as a follower of him, you are like salt, light, and leaven. Salt, meant to bring taste to a flavorless world. And salt, you don't pour it all out on one spot on your plate. That'd be a rough bite. You want to spread it out so everything is seasoned. Light, meant to bring light to pitch black darkness, and it's not supposed to be in one spot. No, it's supposed to be turned on so everyone can have eyes to see leaven. Leaven is a yeast. It causes the whole thing to rise. And it's not meant to be in one place. It's meant to be sprinkled up to cause the whole world to rise to the potential of who God has created and called them to be. You see, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, sin was the influencing agent. If the people of God got around the sin of this world, they became unclean. If a clean person got around an unclean person, the clean person became unclean. But now in the New Testament with Jesus, when Jesus, the clean one, gets around an unclean one, Jesus doesn't become unclean. The unclean becomes clean. The reason that matters is because we can't withdraw and hide out in the church, which is what the church has done for hundreds of years, afraid of being contaminated by the world. No, we're the influencing agent. Remember, we reign in life, we have the highest influence or authority, so we've got to spread out into the areas of life to change the world around us. Are you with me on this? Luke 17, 21, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. The kingdom of heaven is not somewhere in outer space. It's not some fluffy cloud that God rides on. The kingdom is within you. And contained within the kingdom of heaven is all the answers to all the world's problems. 
Every problem the world has, the answer is in heaven. Disease, poverty, brokenness, all of it. And if the kingdom of heaven is within you, then when you walk into these spaces, the answer to the world's problems just showed up. You just walked in and the opportunity for divine solution, for heavenly wisdom, for supernatural power just showed up too. So we've got to stop separating sacred and secular. Because if the kingdom of heaven is within you, then everywhere you go is sacred. Because the kingdom of heaven is there. So it's sacred space. So when you go to work and you go to school and you go home and you go into the areas of life, that is not a secular thing that you're just getting through to get back to one hour a week of sacred space. No, no, it's all sacred because the kingdom of heaven is within you. Come on, think about who we have in this church. Moms and dads and sons and daughters and grandmas and grandpas and brothers and sisters. We have teachers and students and administrators and educators and counselors. We have doctors and nurses and technicians and operators and administrators. We have CEOs and contractors and consultants and uh, supervisors and managers and employees. We have town council people. We have first responders. We have amazing people that are constantly serving, uh, postal workers and and mayors and and council people. We have have people that are professional artists, musicians, uh, professional social media influencers, newscasters, people who tell amazing stories and make amazing things. We have professional athletes and student athletes and coaches and trainers. And we have a bunch of really smart people that I don't even know what they do, but they do it. (laughs) We're not all supposed to lump here. We're supposed to be this and then go there. So here's the question. Where do you go? Where do you go? What's the areas of life that you can instantly see yourself in? You've been sent there by God. Did you ever stop and just ask yourself, like, why am I here? You're here because you're on mission with God. He wants to do something great inside you. The, the, The problem is, is we have a low view of what we're created to do because we have a low view of who we are because we have a low view of who Jesus is. But when you start to see Jesus for who Jesus is, you start to have a much higher view of who you are in him. And so all of a sudden you wake up one day and you'd be like, man, my entire life is releasing the kingdom of God in the space as I go every single day. See, all a hope carrier is is someone who goes into the places of life they go every single day and they're more aware of heavenly realities than earthly circumstances. They just have an expectation of the goodness of God flowing through their life. And they're paying attention to what God wants to do and what God is doing and say, God, I just, I just want to be a part of that. In fact, the Bible tells us that all of creation, all of the areas of life are waiting for the sons and daughters of God to awake and arise and actually go release the father's kingdom that they've been entrusted with. And if you think about this, hope leads. Hope leads. Any area of life, any place, any circumstance, any situation, the person who has the most hope is the de facto leader. It's not the person with the title. It's not the person with the position. It's not the person with the training, the education, the authority. It's the person who has the most hope is the de facto leader. So if we would just radiate with hope in the places we go every day, we instantly become the influencers because people are longing for hope. You with me on this? We got to stop complaining about the world and realize we've been empowered to change it. And if you can catch this, everyone takes their theology into the places they go. Everyone. Atheists take their theology of that there is no God into the places they go. So they believe they're in charge, they're in control, and they got to make it happen. Agnostics, people who don't believe in anything, they take that theology with them everywhere they go. So they believe it doesn't really matter. Why bother? Who cares anyways? Religious people take their religious theology into the places they go all the time. And they think they've got to perform. They've got to earn. They've got to strive. They've got to judge everyone else and make sure everything is right and wrong and good and bad. Selfish people who their theology is themselves. Carry that into the areas of life because it's all about my success, my significance, and my money. Disciples of Jesus 
carry their theology into the areas of life and say, I've been placed here by God to see his kingdom come and his will be done. So if you want to know what you really believe, don't look at what you do for one hour a week. How do you behave in the rest of your life? That will show you what you actually believe because your behaviors always reveal your beliefs. And you take your theology to work and to school and home every single day, whether you want to admit it or not. You with me on this? Come on, look at this. From one man, he made every nation, every ethnos of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them in the exact places where they should live. Out of thousands of years of history and billions of people on this world, God determined that you would be alive here and now placed in the position that you are. He decided that you would live in that neighborhood with that job and that gifting and that role and those resources and that office and that coworker and that opportunity. Why? Because he is the one that's determined the ethnoses, the people groups, and he has picked for where you should be. This gives us so much trust and confidence in the Lord. All of a sudden, it's like if I get fired, I'm good because God's the one who's leading me. If I'm in a spot that I don't want to be, I'm good because God is the one who is leading me. If God has asked me to live in this place or do this job or be responsible for this thing and I don't want to, I can still have so much trust because it's he is the one that has determined it. Not me because he wants to do something through me. Or how about this? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God says, I formed, I knew, I set you apart, I appointed you to what? To be a hope carrier to the ethnoses that you go every single day. In other words, I'm the one that designed you exactly as you are. Listen, some of you, you get so down on yourself. You have so much self-condemnation. You look at everyone else's life and you think they're better than you. This is God saying, I made you exactly as I wanted you to be for the purpose of which I have created you. To be a hope carrier to the ethnos that you are. You with me? You're created for more. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Not to just go to work and go to school and watch Netflix with a bag of Cheetos. You're created for more. You don't need to go to the well of religion. You don't need to go to the well of this world. You just need to like realize, oh my gosh, God has created and called me for so much more. And what is that? It's to be a hope carrier. A hope carrier. A disciple of Jesus living on mission to change their world. You're either a disciple of Jesus or you're a disciple of the world. Who are you being shaped and molded more into the image and likeness of? Because a disciple of Jesus lives on mission to change their world, but a disciple of the world lives for themselves and is changed by the world. And notice it says hope carrier, not hype carrier. It's not about emotions and feelings and and humanitarian do-gooderness. Hope, confident expectation of the goodness of God, the belief that God's kingdom has come and more of it is coming, that it's in me and it's flowing through me. But it has to start right there. Listen, if you've been a part of our church in 2019 was the first time we used the words hope carrier. We shared it with you and missional move hope for the city and we rolled out our new vision and we believed that later in 2019, we were gonna come back around and really launch hope carriers like we're doing right now. But the Lord stopped us. We didn't know why. And then we got into 2020. And you all know what happened in 2020. And then 2021, we thought it was going to happen. The Lord stopped us. 2022, we were convinced we were going to do it. The Lord stopped us. And at every turn, I kept being like, God, why? You're, this is like your thing. Why are you stopping it? And then I realized that the Lord said, we didn't have a high enough discipleship quotient within our church. And you have to be a disciple before you can go change the world. So we had to spend the last bunch of years like learning how to be disciples, learning how to engage the scriptures and pray, go through the ancient future series, the becoming series, literally feels like we spent an entire year last year on kingdom culture. Oh, oh, I get it now. Yeah. Because you got to be a disciple first. Because if we would have pre-rolled it out before we grabbed a hold of this concept of really being a disciple, we would have gone and done a bunch of things for our good and our glory. It would have been about, oh, this is going to be good for my business. 
Oh, this is gonna look really good on social media. Oh, this is gonna make me feel so good about myself. It's not about you. It's about the good of others and the glory of God. And that's what disciples understand, but hype carriers don't. See, I think we're in, in a season right now where God is doing a major change in his people. The best words I have for you, and I'm just, just gonna share it from my heart. The best words I have for you is I think we're in a process of going from good American church to kingdom come. It's the best words I have for you. Good American church. Listen, the last 40 years of church in America was the, the season of the mega church and the multi-site. And, and for 40 years, it, there was a lot of great things that happened. It opened up our eyes to break off religion of the past generation. A lot of people got saved, but we Americanized it. Bigger, faster, better, stronger. And while there was so much good in it and God was moving through it, it drifted into consumerism. Here's typical good American church on a Sunday morning. I know this is no one here, so let me just go ahead and say that, but here's how it goes. It's Sunday morning. It's about 20 minutes before service starts, and we just are like, yeah, let's go to church today. So we get there, and now we're about 20 minutes late, and we come in and we have our kids and we want to check our kids in exactly where we want them to be. There's, we expect a room that's pro, fully prepared for them. And, and we don't want them to go to their age appropriate room. We want them to go with their friend Billy over here because, because Tommy likes Billy. Even though they're seven years apart, I expect Tommy and Billy to be able to be in the same room. And you're going to do exactly what I want for my kid, exactly how I want them. And, and, and the, your systems and protocols don't matter. And then after I check them in exactly where I want, I go out to the cafe and I expect a full American breakfast. I mean, like everything. Waffles and pancakes and syrup and bacon and eggs and a venti frothy something, right? Whatever the thing is. And I don't want to eat it out there because I'm late, but I want to bring it in here because it's like I'm at a dine-in theater, you know? Like, I don't need my hands anyways for what we're doing in there. I'm just watching. So I'm, I'm going to do my thing. And we come in and I don't want to be sat where, I, where I'm asked to sit. And I don't want to sit too far in the front and I don't want to sit too far in the back. And I expect there to be really good music but not too long. And then there should be a message, but the message should be really relevant, inspiring, and funny. Don't make it be too convicting or too challenging because I'm not here to be convicted or challenged. I'm here to feel good about myself because really I didn't come to meet with God. I expect God to be there to do something for me. And then I leave and I get my kids and I go home and I'll come back when I expect God to do something for me again, six weeks, six months from now. And I expect everything to be exactly as the way I remember it. Kingdom come is... I'm here today to meet with God. And I've come with some awe and some reverence and some wonder because I'm a disciple learning to walk with Jesus, learning to follow him and become like him. And I'm filled with the spirit of a living God and I'm practicing my faith. So I actually do expect to be challenged and to be stretched and to be convicted by the Holy Spirit because I'm a hope carrier all week long. And all week I've been out there doing this stuff. I can't wait to be with the people of God and meet with God. I think that old wineskin is drying up and this is where God's pouring wine. And what I love about God is he doesn't tear an old wineskin down. He just lets it dry up. You can sense that this is drying up. And if you're offended here by anything I said, why? It's the greatest thing. Here's pause. Greatest thing you can never ask yourself. If you're in church and you're offended, don't just like run with your offense. Stop and say, why am I offended? What is God trying to show me in my heart? See, I think God is pouring out the wine here. So that's why we're trying to go this way. Because I want to be with wherever God is moving. And the reason this never works is because it's consumerism. And your soul was not built to consume. It was built, built to release God's kingdom and work with God and walk with God. No matter how great the breakfast is here, it will never satisfy your soul. It's the woman at the well going and getting religion and it will never quench her thirst because you're not made to consume. You're made to contribute and engage and walk with God as a disciple. Look at, I love what Jesus says. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Come be a disciple and you'll be on mission with me. Discipleship and mission are linked together. If you're a disciple, you will engage in the mission, but you can't engage in the mission without first being a disciple. And what I love about what Jesus does is he speaks their language. They're fishermen. If they were family people, he would have said, come follow me, I'll make you fathers of men. 
Educators, come follow me, I'll make you teachers of men. Healthcare workers, come follow me, I'll make you healers of men. Business people, come follow me, I'll make you builders, prosperers, blessers of men. Government, I'll make you servers of men. He like speaks our very language. And what you have to understand is you have to be a disciple before you can change the world. Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament Ezra had to go back and rebuild the temple that had been destroyed by the world, and then Nehemiah could come and rebuild the city. You have to rebuild the temple before you can rebuild the city. The temple is not a building, it is a people. You are now the temple of God. You have to be rebuilt as a disciple of Jesus before you can re-go, go and rebuild the city, because if you rebuild the city without first rebuilding the temple, the city will just be torn down again, because you won't know how to live in God's kingdom in the midst of that city. Does that make sense to you? And the irony of all ironies is this. If we just lived as a disciple, you would instantly be a hope carrier everywhere you went. The sad part is, is that we have to use a word like hope carrier to break open our thinking of what really Jesus means when he just says, come be a disciple. Like if you just did what Jesus said in church, don't forget, sake the assembly, a uh, uh, gathering together and, and serve and build up the body of Christ, you'd instantly be a hope carrier. If you were just a disciple and family and said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I will raise up my children in the ways of the Lord. I will honor my parents instantly, a disciple. Education, if you just went and did things with all of your heart, and, and fanned into flame the gifts that have been given to you and pursued wisdom and understanding as if searching for gold and silver and treasure instantly, hope care. If you just served people and washed their feet and prayed for healing the way that Jesus tells us to as disciples, instantly, hope carrier. If you just had some fruit of the spirit and character and didn't love money, instantly, hope carrier. If you just said, it's not about my career or my profession, I'm here to serve people because Jesus tells me to just serve everyone around, instantly, hope carrier. Are you catching it? It's ironically that simple. The kingdom within you will eventually always become the kingdom around you. The kingdom always starts from the inside out. And you can only release the kingdom to the level you're surrendered to it. To the degree you're surrendered to the lordship of Jesus is the degree you can actually release his kingdom in the world around you. I can't change the world until he first becomes king of my world. The authority and the power that you walk in is directly connected to your submission and surrender. Arise, shine, awake up. There's so much more for you than going through the motions, eating Cheetos, going to work, going to school, watching Netflix, catch it. There's no Cheetos in my house. For your light has come. Come on, you are radioactive with hope, a treasure chest of hope, springs of living water. You glow with the glory of God and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth. Darkness covers the areas of life. Darkness covers family. Darkness covers education. Darkness covers healthcare and business. Darkness covers government and arts and media. Darkness covers sports and technology. Darkness even covers the church. And thick darkness is over the people. They're lost, lonely, and broken, but... Best word, but the Lord rises upon you, you, and his glory appears over you. Nations, ethnos, people groups, the people groups, you go every single day. You don't even have to do anything different, but be aware that God is with you where you already go, will come to your light. They will see the hope and kings, the influencers of this world to the brightness of your dawn and God's kingdom will come and his will will be done. Come on, church, we have a city to serve and a kingdom to release. God is doing a new thing in a new way. So let's go on a journey together by faith. Get a Hope Carrier Field Journal. Say, God, I don't even know why I'm here, but I believe today that I'm here for a reason. And so by faith, open up my eyes, open up my heart, change my life so I can be a part of what you're doing. So Holy Spirit, Will you lift up our heads? Would you open up our eyes? Would you speak to our hearts and show us, guide us, lead us into this truth that we were created for so much more 
than we're currently experiencing. God, thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the responsibility that you have decided to release your kingdom through us in this city, in this time, in the areas of life you have entrusted to us every single day. And so may we move forward by faith to see your kingdom come and your will be done. Jesus, teach us how to be hope carriers. In your name we pray, amen. We are created to be hope carriers, and we've got some things to help you with that on hopecarrier.com. Check it out today. And hey, if you didn't get our Hope Carrier Field Journal back in the spring, they're available for free this week. Like an explorer on a journey with God, use this to capture discoveries about who you are, who God is, and what you've been created to do. You can grab one for free today. And while you're there, don't forget to check out all the really cool new Hope Carrier gear. And if you need prayer for anything going on in your life, we want to pray for you. Scan the QR code to start that conversation with someone from our team. And as a church, we believe that everything we have comes from the Lord. And he invites us to trust him with our finances. And one of the ways that we do that is by giving back to him. So if you'd like to give your tithe or offering, you can do that online. Now we hope to see you in just a minute in Hangouts, but as we go, declare these truths with me over your life. God is good. Jesus has forgiven me. I am loved and everything is possible. Have a great week. Thank you.